Hello everyone. Welcome to my show Career Startup Podcast, a podcast to spotlight Asian leaders and interesting people that I meet in my life. This is your host Priyanka Komla. Today I have with me a very special guest from London. Yes, you heard it right. And she is Sangeeta Waldron. Sangeeta Waldron is an award-winning publicist and runs her own London-based public relations agency, Serendipity PR and Media. She works across business, arts and culture in growth and international markets. Sangeeta, welcome to my show. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Absolutely. It's such a pleasure. And for our listeners out there, Sangeeta recently authored a book which is called The PR Knowledge Book. It came out in 2019 and uh, we'd love we'd love to learn more about what the book is about and more about Sangeeta as well. Sangeeta helps brands create inclusive and diverse content and she's also a global contributing editor for the Indian Corporate Social Responsibility Network, India CSR which is the largest news platform on sustainable business news and corporate social responsibility in India. Sangeeta, you have such an amazing portfolio and thank you for being on our show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. So can I say Sangeeta is synonymous with public relations? How does it make you feel? <laughs> wow, I've never um I mean no one's ever put it to me that way. It sounds amazing. um yes i love that uh it's a long journey it's taken me a long time to get here so it's uh, a lot of hard work um but it's not been a journey that's planned so to have that recognition right now from you that's uh, that's pretty that's amazing thank you absolutely and you deserve it as well so sangeeta i know you started your career writing speeches for a previous uk minister and several other ministers how was that experience when you look back what's one thing that you would tell us about well um it's funny because i as you know i now run my own pr agency and i was doing another one of these talks uh, right at the beginning when i set up my own agency and somebody was just saying to me tell me about yourself and i said oh when i was in my 20s i was writing uh speeches for a previous prime minister and ministers and they went in your 20s and it up until that moment it really hadn't struck me that it was that amazing or it was that a big stand out point um but now when you do reflect and you've got those years behind you you can reflect and think yeah i mean that was pretty amazing and it was amazing to be working in government at that time it was in the hub of everything but um it wasn't what i actually set out to do when i left university and when i left university i thought anyone and everyone would want to employ me you have that notion when you come out of university and then you realize nobody actually wants you because you've got no skills and so that's how i sat the civil service entrance exam and got through and started my career but while i was doing that and i was in the cabinet office for that time i thought this is not really what i set out to do and i resigned and that's when uh you know and everyone said you want to resign it's like one of the best jobs it's a job for life you have a great pension you're going to go up uh in the you know up in the organization and um but it's not what i really wanted to do because i really wanted to work within the creative industry um and uh and that's how i really sort of found my path on to public relations after leaving the cabinet office that's pretty impressive um i know in 2009 you set up serendipity pr and media and you work across different domains how did it all start you know when you spoke about your experience as a as a grad student with no you know professional skills at that point how did you transform yourself into this business woman and having created your own empire well it's um just before i set up serendipity pr and media i was director of a leading breast cancer charity sorry director of comms and marketing for a leading uh, breast cancer charity here in the uk and it was a very busy job you're working 6 months ahead because you're working with all the magazines 
uh, I had a big team. And when I started there, it was actually just myself and two other members of, t of staff. The time I left, we were an award-winning team of 10. Um, and then I got married and I became a mum. And I decided I couldn't do that kind of job and be a good mum. I, I recognise what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And I, I'm not good at doing both. Um, and I wanted to take time out to be a mum. And... Um, we were fortunate that we could afford to do that, living in London. Um, and I, for the first year and a half, I was a stay-at-home mum. But then I found I was actually quite bored. And I needed to do more to stimulate myself. And I, and I would be a better mum for, for working. So I kind of had that defining point. But I also thought I didn't want to go back into PR. I wanted to do something completely different. So I retrained. <laughs> to be a tarot reader and um, I was a tarot reader and every time I would do these readings in central London people would ask me so what do you actually what was your other job before you did this and I said oh I worked in PR and media and they said oh well you know we've got something we want to launch you know we'd love to and I said no no I'm not doing that I'm a tarot reader and um, and then 2008 happened just before 2009 and there was this global economic downturn and um, my I, husband remember that, I remember that very yeah. well because I graduated in 2009. Yeah, so it, it impacted a lot of people. It impacted us as a family. And um, the, my husband works in the city. City became unstable overnight. So I thought, well, I need to now do something. Um, so I set up Serendipity PR and Media in 2009. And it was a time when we were still not out of that global economic recession. But I thought if I can survive this, as a company, I will survive anything. And also, I think when I became a mum, I also had the confidence now to run my own company. It gave me something kind of clicked that I was now ready to do that, that next stage in my, in my career and my journey. And um, I remember when I first set up my um, agency, I went, you join different networking. That's the whole uh, secret to being an entrepreneur is your networking and I joined different networking groups and I met somebody and he gave me the best piece of business advice I ever got which is the first three years of setting up a business you are just sowing the seeds of your networking and it's in year three and year four that you start to reap those contacts and that's true um, you know your first three years you are learning you're going to make mistakes. You're going to learn from those mistakes. I made many mistakes. Um, and um, you learn that uh, sometimes just to take a step back, uh, it's not about chasing and that the right clients will come to you. Because when you start up, you think, oh, you need clients. How are you going to get clients? And um, when I stopped looking at the clients, the clients just came. So that was, again, that was a learning for me. And, um, and I think that was the best bit of advice that the first three years of your business is just growing your networks and your network is so important. And also I learned, I mean, my, my company is called Serendipity PR and Media and Serendipity is very much about being open, about uh, connecting with different people. And I think when you connect with different people and you're open, then that's when the magic happens. It's very interesting as you unravel several aspects of your life, Sangeeta, from being a you know a tarot reader, a mom, <laughs> to being a, a PR expert. You know, it's you know it's very fascinating that you know you always want to unleash your creativity and channel your energy to help other people succeed. You know, that's what I, I see in you as you share your experiences. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, have you done tarot reading for yourself, like trying to figure out what your future might look like? Just it's very difficult to do it for yourself, but I, I, what I do try and do, and it's something I've done uh, throughout my life, um, and it's just got stronger as I've got older, is to listen to my intuition, you know, my inner voice. And I think it serves us all. You, you know, you'll have a feeling when something feels right and when something feels wrong. And um, when things don't feel right, sometimes I override that 
and I still go ahead and do it, even though it doesn't feel quite right. And then as I go down that road, I realize I should have listened. So I think we all have that inner voice. Uh, so I, in answer to your question, not quite being able to read my own tarot, but listening to my inner voice. That's an excellent piece of advice for budding entrepreneurs, especially. Now tell us a little bit more about your professional experience. I know you help brands thrive. What's the thought process when a brand approaches and asks you to help them succeed? How does that process look like? Can you walk us through it? Oh, well, it's different for every different um, brand. Uh, some brands are new, so completely new startups. Some brands are established, so every brand will have a different need. So it's really understanding what their main objective is. So some brands are, so the new brands, they want to build a brand, they want to build their audience, they might have something they want to launch or they have a campaign or they have, um, so it's helping them understand their brand and where they want to go with it and help them build that. Some brands are already established, but they find that they're kind of stuck or they're not having the reach that they want to or that they've got something new that they want to add to their brand and helping them understand how to define that message and how to enter that market. Uh, and just on that, some brands that have been local now want to go global, helping them do that, understanding their customers, understanding the new market and how does that translate with their messaging. And then there are some brands who, um, they are, you know, they're just stuck and they, they want to refresh themselves. They want to embrace social media. They don't know how to. Mm -hmm. So then again, helping brands uh, get onto social network platforms like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, find the right platform for them that will work with their services and with their, with their ambitions. Thank you for walking us through the logical steps that you take as brands uh, you know try to make a mark and a niche for themselves now i'm curious uh, sangeeta with this global covid pandemic be it the black lives matter and other global issues how do you think brands are adopt adapting themselves to the reality to make sure their pr strategy is actually relevant to today's world and let me give you an example you know recently fair and lovely uh, you know it's it's trying to reassess its brand uh, the naming of the brand you know it's a cosmetic company and they're trying to be more relevant to avoid any kind of discrimination. And as somebody who is working at that intersection, how do you see these kinds of uh, strategies? That's such a great question. I mean, there's so much going on right now. We've had the pandemic at the beginning of this in March has affected everyone. It stopped the world in its tracks. And, you know, there have been some brands, we just take the COVID, the, the pandemic, and how that has impacted brands. Um, what we have seen is brands have actually done really well in understanding how to empathize with their consumers and um, they've turned it around. They've actually joined the dots better than governments around the world. They've reacted and they've reacted with empathy. So you've had um, brands um, from pret manger which is a food chain that um, supplied here the, in the UK our frontline health workers with masks, uh, with food and drinks. You've had um, global brands, uh, luxury brands like Prada, um, uh, start to create the sanitizers in France for the frontline workers. So brands have really stepped up. But during this pandemic, we've also had uh, a whole debate about diversity and inclusiveness within the Black Lives Matter conversation. And I think for far too long, brands have been lazy. Um, and so some of the same brands I've just mentioned have let themselves down there because there are two different aspects. So you've had some of the luxury brands like Gucci a couple of years ago had the black masks and the, you know, it sort of, it was negative towards black uh, yeah, people. Right. Um, so you've had certain brands not delivering and consumers now expect better. They want brands to be doing better, not just with their inclusive and their diverse um, conversations, but also with their sustainability. And also the next generation are looking for better actions from brands. And 
you know, brands can't uh, ignore that anymore and there's no excuse. So um, it's how do the brands then make that transition? Because what you do find in lots of brands, there aren't, there aren't enough people of color like you and me at the top making those decisions. Uh, so obviously sometimes their messaging is off. They've got the wrong kind of ad that goes out and that's where they experience the backlash because they're not diverse or inclusive enough at the top. That's a very interesting observation and we've seen it with several different bands and very different organizations, the way they react to certain situations. And, you know, sometimes it makes us feel, uh, you know, as an outsider, why isn't the leadership paying enough attention to have more of a diverse leadership pipeline who can help them understand, hey, this doesn't resonate with a certain culture. And what do you think is not how the entire audience, uh, you know, thinks about our messaging as well. So the narrative and the storytelling approach needs to align with cultural values globally. Uh, Absolutely. And be better. They have to be telling better stories. Very and, true. You know, and, you know, I grow, grew up in a time when the magazines, TV, there were very, very, very few people of color on your TV screens, um, in your magazines, your news readers. And I remember my parents would, if they saw anyone who was black or Asian on TV, they'd get excited because they could, they could um, relate, right? relate to that. Exactly. And, you know, and then as you grow up in that, you, you just don't see yourself represented. In, and it goes uh, with things like makeup, fashion, you know, as young women, you want to be able to identify with the models or the, the makeup. You want to look like everyone else mm -hmm. and you just didn't see yourself. You were invisible. But now um, I think women, young women like yourselves are seeing more women of color coming in with a voice, with a strong voice. They're not playing the stereotypes um, and that they, they are just representative of, you know, of what you and I are up to in our everyday lives. We're not, we're not, you know, the outsiders within societies. We're inside, but we're, we just don't seem to be there. Um, that has been for a long time. And I think 2020 has really brought that to the service. That's a very good point, Sangeeta. As, um, you know, as people from a diverse background, we form the fabric of the society as well. And our voices need to be heard and be represented. Now, let me ask you this, Sangeeta. What is your personal brand? How would you talk about your personal brand? That's a good question. I mean, I know um, I would say my brand is very aligned with Serendipity's brand which is um it's intuitive uh it's about paying it forward where i can and that can be simple things um it doesn't always have to be the big gestures mm -hmm. uh i would also say my my brand's very much about sustainability my personal brand is about sustainability and about kindness to ourselves and to the planet i think those would be my my four key ones thank you and what advice would you have for our listeners as they're looking at creating their own personal brand, are there three things that you would suggest that they think about? Yeah, um, my, my first would be kindness. People always remember kind people, you, you know, and you always want to help kind people. Uh, and kindness has for a long time been underestimated in business. It's been a, you know, something that's weak, but really kindness can be very strong because when you're, you know, you can stand in your strength and do powerful business deals and still be kind about it. Um, I think um, paying it forward is really important within that. And paying it forward works beautifully on social media. So when you're an open networker on Twitter, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, then you're really paying it forward and you're opening up your network to lots of other people and you just don't know who people know so if you think i'm a lawyer and i'm only going to network with lawyers you're just swimming in a very small pool full of lawyers but if you think bigger than that and you think you know i'm going to network with bakers artists you know whoever you just don't know who people might know and how that magic happens so and my third one would be is I think now there is a time that whatever kind of brand you are people want to see 
how sustainable you are. What are your actions with the planet? Um, because the planet has been in crisis for a long time and we're now, we're living it. You know, we're living right now. We've all experienced how better the, the atmosphere is, how better, you know, how green things are. Um, we are more mindful about wasting less food. So I think, you know, these kind of, these, they're three sort of ethics but I think these ethics, if they translate in your brand and your personal brand, they make you very powerful. Those are excellent pieces of wisdom, you know, be it being kind, you know, pay it forward and working towards a sustainable future. I think those are very three key aspects that everybody needs to, uh, you know, think through, you know, as they develop their personal brand. So thank you for giving us that advice. Now tell us about your book, The PR Knowledge. What inspired you to write the book and what is the book about? Um, well, you know, I've been a publicist now for over 30 years and you always find people will always ask, you know, me along the way, what is public relations? What does it mean? What does it do? That was one question. The other it was, uh, can we pick your brains? And, you know, when you're running your own business, you're, you're running a business, you know, however much I, I do like to pay it forward and help and I do clients on pro bono. I'm still running a business. I'm living in London. I've got to make a living. So there's just so much brain picking, you know, I can, I can do for people. So I thought if I write this book, all those people that can't afford my time can read the book and understand how to do PR for themselves. And also there are, you know, there are lots of, uh, we've had a growth in the last 10 years through social media of, stay-at-homepreneurs, mumpreneurs, uh, people doing their own cottage industries. And they've got great products, but they don't know then how to, do, how to raise the profile of the brand, how to contact journalists. So this book does it all for people in very simple ways with lots of um, case stories. So case, um, stories where I've personally worked with people and how they've, you know, the, how they've turned things around or how they've crisis managed a situation because again things can go wrong with your brand and how do you um, react to a story um, and then how to create a campaign so that book encompasses all that and also my pet subject of networking and serendipity that's pretty amazing i'm quite sure it'll be an interesting book for all of us to read what's the best feedback you've received on your book wow i mean i've received a lot of feed you know I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I mean, I, when I wrote the book, I had 10 um, really big voices from the world of business endorse my book. And I've had some great things said. Um, but I think for me, when readers come back to me, um, that's, there's nothing like that. And I had a, there were two. One uh, was a student who happened to read my book and he um, found my email address and he sent me an email just saying, that book just was, it made sense to him in every way. And it was simply written and it was something that they, they really enjoyed. He really enjoyed it. And the other was, um, it's a small, it's a, it was just a small thing, but I do a Pilates class. Um, I used to before COVID on a Saturday. And one of the women in the class said, I've just bought your book. I had no idea because I didn't talk about my book in the class and she had bought it and she said, you know what? It's so, it's brilliant. I'm actually, I've just started a new job and part of my role is PR and I'm just doing everything you're telling me. And that just meant so much to me. I was blown away. Somebody actually went out, bought my book and is practicing what was, what I've set out in the book. So yeah, those two have, you know, better than any big sort of CEO saying anything. It's just when the reader finds it useful. Right. And people who meet in your everyday life, you know, when they feel the impact of your book, I think that's definitely a, a wonderful feeling. So congratulations on that. And Thank you. Any more kudos to come your way. Now, I know you have a very successful career, you know, in the last three decades, I should say. But was there ever a low moment in your career that you would like to share with us? Low moment. Um... I wouldn't say low, low, I think maybe I'm just trying to think of a, of a, I guess when I decided when I was working just before I set up Serendipity PR and Medium, 
and I was working for a breast cancer charity. It wasn't a low moment, but it was a big decision of stepping out of the corporate, you know, structure, working for an organization, um, saying goodbye to my colleagues and working, you know, working with others. Um, wasn't a it was a kind of a low moment because you are going into the unknown and you're going to be working on your own. So it was, I would say that maybe not doesn't quite answer your question, but it was a transition for me and it was the unknown rather than low, but yes, saying goodbye to that kind of world and then starting my own. Yeah, I know that must have been a, you know, a tough decision in some ways because there's a lot of uncertainty involved as well as to how the future look like looks like. But I think as a as a tarot reader, probably you could connect the dots again and say like, why not? Now, tell us a little bit more about sustainability. I know that's something that's very close to your heart. And I know you're also the global contributing editor for the India Carpet Social Responsibility Network. What is the impact of your role with that initiative? Um, well, I know, I mean, I've been writing about uh, sustainability now and corporate social responsibility, CSR, for just over 10 years. And I used to write for a platform, an American platform, which is at that time was the largest platform on sustainable business news. And India CSR, the editor used to read my stories and he used to say, oh, I'd love to, can I share them on my platform? And we had an agreement with the site I, write, I used to write for and they would uh, allow India CSR to write the stories. And then, um, and I just got, and I've always had a passion uh, uh, and, a, and a love for India. And there were so many amazing things happening in India. And when he said to me, would you like to come and write for us and be our global contributing editor? I just jumped at the chance. Because uh, I think there are so, I mean, right now, there are so many extraordinary things happening in, with regards to social enterprise in India. And I wanted to throw a spotlight on those stories. Um, and then... Just on that, within PR, there's a lot happening with sustainability, with corporate social responsibility. And it goes back to your original question about um, how have brands responded right now during the pandemic and also with uh, this whole debate on Black Lives Matter and diversity. And I think that's really key. And I'm actually just finished writing my second book. That's which, awesome. <laughs> yeah, which I've used this time, which is corporate social responsibility is not public relations. And that is that you just don't do things uh, for spinning a story. It, you know, it has to be a true narrative. It has to be really sit with the brand. There's no point saying, you know, I believe in sustainability when you all your habits are something else. Uh, or if a brand says, you know, we are CSR through and through, we, we care about what we manufacture and how we manufacture, and yet you find most of their um, products come from a sweatshop, and that's when brands fall down. But if you put CSR at the heart of your brand, at the heart of your story, then your PR will follow automatically because people only have good things to say about you. Um, so that I think see, sustainability is going, to, is going to be key and we're going to see more and more brands talking about sustainability because us the consumer are going to demand how are brands uh, performing. That's very true Sangeeta. Days have changed, it's no longer the end product that people care about but the entire supply chain through which the end product is actually manufactured and marketed and the other point is the fact that there's a lot of consumer awareness that's happening. So people are really paying attention to what a company does. It's no longer the, the written on investment or what the you know, stock value is. It's more about the leadership and what kind of values are being instilled as part of your culture as well. Oh, absolutely. And, I, and you know, doing the research of writing this book, um, what we call ethical, um, ethical funds or ethical investments, people who want to invest in companies that's one of their key things that they look at is how good is a company? How sustainable is it? Because there will be so much backlash if a company is kind of rotten, you know, if they're not doing things in a, in a clean way. And 
organizations, businesses, however small you are, however big you are, you need to be doing better. Um, and recently here in the UK, we had a story, you know, we've had, um, like everyone, we've been, you know, in lockdown with the COVID-19 uh, virus. And we found in the, just as we were doing our sort of easing of lockdown, there's a, there's a, a place, a region here in the UK called Leicester which had to go back under lockdown and they found that there was a hot spot of people with the the virus and what they also found is a lot of people were working in sweatshops can you believe it here in in the uk people working in sweatshops um, of manufacturing garments uh, for online brands and that and those people were forced to work because their pay is so it's below the minimum wage they were scared to say no and that i think that you know brands like that. and one of the brands that uh gets their garments from this sweatshop said well they were kind of saying that they didn't really know about it that's you know that doesn't work anymore that's a load of bullshit basically you've got to know your supply chain you can't kind of hide against under that ignorance anymore and um, transparency is the key. Yeah, absolutely. Sustainable relationships with your end consumers and stakeholders as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think that is going to be become more and more of a of a of a subject of a topic in conversation. And they're all you know. And again, while researching my book and, and writing it, the next generation, which is called Generation Z they are you know they are conscious they're aware and they are far more aggressive than you know the likes of my generation they want to see companies doing better and they're demanding it so brands will have to those are their future consumers so they have to learn how to talk to them and engage with them um, so brands have to learn to do better and be very accountable as well i think that's where the conversation yeah. is leading us towards when is your book uh, expected to be published? Well, it's just gone to the publisher now. So it goes through that second phase where you work with the book editor. So if everything goes well and timings, because also because of the pandemic, it's shifted lots of timelines. I'm hoping before the end of this year. Well, that's amazing to hear. And uh, Thank best you. wishes from our career podcast <laughs> uh, business Thank as well. You. Now, when I look at you, Sangeeta, you're such an accomplished woman but you're very humble and gracious in terms of sharing uh, your experiences and some of the vulnerabilities as you have put yourself through in this process. Now, tell us a little bit about your childhood. Did you envision yourself to be where you are today? No, absolutely not. And I don't think most people, you know, when, they, when their kids have a, well, some children do have a sense of themselves. Um, I was born here in the UK. I was here to the age of 14 and my father uh, was from India from the north of India and when he took early retirement from his job he was a teacher and he wanted to go back to India but for my mum my brother and myself it would have been our first time in India my mother's Indian but born and brought up in South Africa so uh, we only spoke English at home growing up here in the UK but we went we went I, when I was 30, 14 went to go and live in India for nine years I did my rest of my uh, schooling my college my university and then when I was about 21 I said to my mum look I've done everything that's been expected but now I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna go back to London uh, because not really growing up with Hindi as my, you know, that's um, in India, the, the main language. And I was at a disadvantage, so I can't read or write Hindi. Um, and I, when I went to India, I did French. Uh, so it was a little bit of a mismatch. Um, I didn't quite settle into everything uh, there. And so, so my, my childhood uh, was... I guess it was an adventure, you know, but you don't see that when you're 13, 14, you know, your parents are uprooting you, taking you to a completely different country um, where everything is different. And those days, India only had one TV channel. 
uh, and uh, that used to come on in the evenings. Uh, so you used to wait for TV and um, it was a very different place to what it is now. And you couldn't get all the things that you, I was used to as a 13, 14 year old. Music, um, everything was so different. Education was so different. So that was a really testing time for me. Um, and then when I got to college, I found my stride a bit because um, college is a little bit more relaxed. You, you know who you are a little bit more. And I went to a college in a place called Chandigarh um, and I went to a girls college and I just loved it. I loved all the girls, all my friends and had a great time. And then I went on to university. But again, at that time in India, working, you could only work in a big city like Delhi or Mumbai and city life in India is very hectic you you've got to know how to navigate getting on the bus how to navigate crossing the roads and I couldn't do any of those things crossing a road was something I just couldn't do so I just couldn't see myself you know managing in a big city but I, I knew how to manage myself here in London and, and it was it was straightforward for me so I when I, I left home when I was in my 20s came back to London and I was lucky, you know, my mom didn't stop me. She knew, I think she understood um, that I was, I was born, you know, for, for, for city life here in the West. And um, I came back. Um, and then, as I, as I said, you know, when I came back, uh, there was a recession going on. Nobody wanted to employ me. I thought, you know, I'm a graduate of course people would want me but I didn't have any office skills and that's how I set the civil servants entrance exam but it was a tough time because I didn't have you know my family around me I didn't have my mom because in between I should also say while we were in India I lost we lost my dad when I was 16 and at that time my mom asked should we stay on in India or should we come back to London and my my brother who's younger than me and I said well look we've come this far let's see if we can make it work and we stayed on and my my brother and my mom eventually built a house in India and you know that's where they set their roots so when I came back to London I was on my own I didn't have that that sort of that those roots so to speak so it's quite a and when you're 20 you're trying to find your feet you know, you're trying to save, you, you know, all those things you've got. You don't have the backdrop of a home. It, it's harder. It's tougher. Uh, but I was determined to make it work. And I didn't see myself going back. So I only, you know, I had to make it work here. And I, and I have. Um, yeah, I, I have. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And I go and see my family when I can. Um, and last year I, you know, I went to India and I spent wonderful time with my mom. So, uh, yes, uh, it, life is, I don't think life is ever straightforward. It always throws you a curveball. And I think this year has shown each and every one of us, you can never plan because you just don't know what's around the corner. I'm quite sure that must have been a very challenging uh, experience for you as you share you know, the childhood, uh, some of the ups and downs that you had to go through at a very tender age. But I'm so proud of you, Sangeeta, because now when you look back, you figured out your calling and you had a supportive family, especially your mom who believed in your abilities and who trusted that you could create a life of your own and be happy. So kudos on that. And I'm quite sure you're, you're an inspiration and, uh, you know, for your kids and for our listeners out here. How does your mom feel about your success? Well, um, it's, um, do you know, my mom has always believed I would write a book right from a child. She always used to say to me, you're going to write a book. And I was like, oh yeah, mom. And then she, all my life, that's always been something she'd say, you know, you're going to write a book one day. I know you're going to write a book. So when I wrote my first book, um, last year and it came out, she was so over the moon. I've never seen my mom like that. She was so happy and when I went to go and see her in October she made me take a picture of her reading my book and then she asked me to send it to everyone in her whatsapp <laughs> so I mean she was like mega mega proud you know as you want your mum to be um I think she was more proud of my book than you know of me having her first grandchild 
you know, it was that big a thing for her. And then sadly, um, this year in January, I lost my mum. So um, I am so pleased that the book came out when it did and she got to see it and experience it. And I'm sure she has made this second book happen. Um, so yeah, uh, she, she was just, she's been, and you're right, you know, my mum is, she has always seen something in me. She's always known I'm strong. Maybe when I didn't even recognize it in myself at times, but she's always seen, I think parents do, don't they? I can see it from my son. They always see the bigger picture. Right. Uh, and yes, so I am sure she's, she's been there. And you know, when I was writing this second book, it wasn't always easy because what I didn't realize was that I was dealing with my grief when I was writing it. And there were times when I was trying to write it and I kept saying to my husband, I can't write this book. It's so tough because I can't get the thoughts straight. And I kept, and I was going at it and it, then it was only really in April, May that things started to seem clearer on the page, literally. And I think at that time, I, my head was just so full of other stuff going on. And I, I put that down to, you know, early stages of my grief, of losing my mum. Uh, I'm quite sure your mom's blessings are with you wherever she is. And uh, you've, you've really taken strides. Uh, and I'm at a loss of words. You've really taken, uh, you know, this experience and have channelized it to create an impact with a purpose. And I think, uh, you know, that's a, that's a very good trait to have Sangeeta. And it's, it's very hard, you know, being in such situations and still trying to figure out a, a path forward. So yeah. I'm, I'm really, uh, I really admire you for what you're doing to yourself and to people around you. Uh, Thank you. So you need to feel very proud of what you're doing. Yeah, no, I, yeah, sometimes you need, I, I'm, I'm one of these, my husband always says, you should know it by now. But, you know, sometimes it's just nice when other people remind you. Uh, so thank you. And all those valuable experiences in your life. We have a fun rapid fire on for you. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. Go Absolutely. ahead. So you tell me the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the following words. Okay. Crisis management. <laughs> say, that, say that first one again. Crisis management. PR. A fun fact about you? Fun. You are fun? <laughs> <laughs> I am fun. <laughs> what makes you happy? Uh, I would say my family, my son and my husband. Role model? Oh, I would say my mom. Here's a tricky one. What is your native language and how would you describe yourself in one word in your native language? My native uh, language is English. And uh, I would, oh, that's a tough one. There's two things that spring to mind. One is um, the English rose, nothing like an English rose, but I think just the essence of, of, of a rose. And sweet pea is a flower you get here. And I've always loved that flower. So I, yeah, those are the two things that have come to my mind. That's amazing. It's such a pleasure to have you on my show, Career Startup Podcast, Sangeeta. Do you have any parting thoughts for our listeners? And can you share your experience being on the show? Uh, I've loved it. You've asked some really interesting questions, questions that have had to make me think. Um, I've enjoyed uh, talking to you. And I really hope your listeners get something out of this. And I would just say, you know, the last thing is, you know, I think right now we're at this kind of tipping point where um, people like us, people of colour, um, now want to be seen and not just seen, heard. So we should all support each other. And uh, there's something I, I do. It hasn't happened because of the COVID uh, situation, but I work with Asian Voice newspaper here in the UK and we run a quarterly uh, women's uh, session where I moderate a panel and we will always have a British Asian woman on the panel to give her a voice and I just think if we can just do that in our everyday lives like you're doing I think that's really important whether we're, we're men or women we should have that platform to be heard. I totally agree with that and thank you Sangeeta for being on our show and to our listeners out there uh, Sangeeta Walden 
who's an award-winning public relations expert, and she has two books, uh, <laughs> one coming up soon, and I'm quite sure we'll have a lot of interesting nuggets of wisdom to learn and lean into. So thank you again for joining us on this wonderful show, and we hope uh, you can continue learning from each other. And this is your host, Priyanka Komla, signing off until another episode with another interesting guest. Thank you. <laughs>